Hello and welcome to the little shop of crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. In store today is a nail-biting manhunt that takes place during one afternoon. Five 911 calls were placed throughout the day, and I'm going to play clips from all of them shortly. But first, a little shopkeeping. My name is Steve and I offer interesting true crime cases most weeks. Usually solved, but occasionally mysterious. So if you fancy a bit more of that, you know what to do. And if you have any lesser known true crime cases you'd like me to cover, my email address is down below. Okay, let's investigate. This is the kidnap of Denise Amber Lee. Today we take our first, but let's face it, probably not last trip over to Florida. If you like golden beaches, blue skies, oranges, and theme parks galore, Florida has you covered. Tens of millions flock to the Sunshine State every year, where they mingle with the cliched roller skaters on Miami Beach, ride one of those fan boat thingies down the alligator infested Everglades, or enjoy the queues inside its world famous Orlando resorts. Sounds like paradise, but Florida has become synonymous with danger. Sure, it gets battered by far more hurricanes than any other state, but I'm talking crime. Most of you are probably familiar with the Florida Man memes that stem from the state's bizarre headlines. There's even a board game. But actually, it's all a little unfair. In reality, its crime rates are pretty average for the country. And in Sarasota County, near the west coast of Florida, in between Tampa and Fort Myers, is the city of Northport. Rich in archaeological history and natural springs, Northport is pretty big, weighing in at about 100 square miles, but is home to just 75,000 people or so. It's quiet, with low crime and real estate rates making it an idyllic place to raise a young family. Which is exactly what Denise and Nathan Lee were doing back in 2008. The couple started off as high school sweethearts, hooking up in their senior year. Nathan was a popular wisecracking jock and Denise was described as a quiet, kind and intelligent young woman. For their first Valentine's Day, Nathan gave Denise a $40 heart-shaped ring, which she never took off. They quickly fell in love, got married and moved into a modest, rented three-bedroom home on Latour Avenue, a quiet street sparsely populated with houses and lined with tall trees. By 2008, they were parents to two young boys, Noah who was two and Adam who was six months old. Nathan worked three jobs to support his blossoming young family, and Denise was a loving stay-at-home mum who doted over their children. At times, it wasn't easy. They didn't have much money, but they were happy. The 17th of January 2008 was an unseasonably warm Thursday. Nathan left for work early that morning for his shift as an electric meter reader. Shortly after 11am, he called Denise while on a break at work, and they chatted for about five minutes, while Denise was cutting Noah's hair on the back porch. For the most part, they just spoke about the weather and how warm it was in the house that day. Nathan told her she should open the windows and let some air in, and she replied that she already had. Everything seemed fine, and Nathan went back to work until he finished his shift at 3pm. Nathan called Denise again to let her know he was coming home, but there was no answer. He tried again a further eight times during his 25 minute drive home. When he arrived and pulled into the driveway, he noticed that all of the windows were now closed. He entered the house and there was no sign of her, and though the windows were closed, they were unlatched. It was then that he started to panic, because this wasn't something Denise ever did. Her keys and phone were on the living room sofa. 
Like most people, these weren't things she would ever leave the house without, and she certainly wouldn't leave without their children, both of whom Nathan found upstairs alone, in the same crib. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry, and the kids were obviously too young to relay any information to him. He knew something was wrong and immediately called the police. It was 3.29pm. North Port Emergency. Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got home from work and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. Soon after his 911 call, police arrived at Nathan's house, where they began knocking on neighbours' doors to see if anyone had seen or heard anything. And to their surprise, they got a promising lead. Sometime between 1.30pm and 2pm, the Lee's neighbour, Jennifer Eckhart, was watching TV, but had caught sight of something suspicious through the window. A dark green Chevy Camaro had been driving very slowly, circling back and forth in front of her home about five times. It was a distinctive car with a black car bra. Now, I had no idea cars could even wear bras, but it's apparently that black covering on the front designed to protect against small impacts. She became suspicious and went out into her front garden just as the car pulled into Nathan and Denise's driveway, and she made eye contact with its driver. Assuming he'd found the house he was looking for, Jennifer went back inside and continued watching TV, but curiosity got the better of her and 10 minutes later she went back outside again, just as the car was pulling away. She couldn't see who was inside, but she had already got a good look at the driver, so she was able to give police a brief description of him. The next call Nathan made was to tell Denise's father, Rick Goff, that she had likely been kidnapped. Rick happened to be a police sergeant in the neighbouring Charlotte County. Within 30 minutes, he'd helped to orchestrate an enormous search for his missing daughter, which included police dogs, patrols, and even a helicopter scouring the Northport area. A BOLO, or a Be On The Lookout bulletin was issued, and police in the area were told to keep an eye out for a dark green Camaro, Denise, and a chubby Caucasian male with greying hair in his mid to late 30s. More than two hours passed, and there was still no sign of Denise and no further leads. That is until 6.14pm when they received a 911 call from none other than Denise herself. Are you blindfolded if you have to press the button? 
At this point, Denise's captor realised she had his phone and terminated the call. Clearly, she was incredibly distressed, but I want to point out the intelligence she showed given the circumstances. She was able to tell the operator that she didn't know her captor and was able to provide her full name and the street she lived on, answering the operator's questions in a way that made it sound to her captor as if she were talking to him. Police attempted to trace the call, but it was an older phone and didn't have GPS, so this wasn't possible. They were, however, able to identify the man who had registered the number. Michael Lee King Michael was a 36-year-old man originally from Michigan, but who now also lived in Northport, just a 13-minute drive away from Denise and Nathan's home. A plumber by trade, he'd been unemployed for several months, was facing bankruptcy, and his home was on the brink of foreclosure. He was also recently divorced, with his ex-wife leaving him as sole provider for their 12-year-old son. King had a very low IQ, somewhere around 76, which placed him in the borderline mental disability range. This was apparently likely due to a sledding accident he had when he was 6, which left him with severe frontal lobe damage. But before now, he lived a pretty normal life and had never been in trouble with the law. Since Denise was able to provide her name and home street during her own 911 call, it was immediately passed on to officers dealing with her disappearance, and the tape was played to Rick, her dad, who confirmed it was her voice. It was quickly becoming evident that someone, most likely Michael, had abducted Denise and was holding her captive against her will. During Denise's 911 call, her captor was heard mentioning his cousin Harold. <laughs> Well, just after her call was terminated, at 6.23pm, a third 911 call came in, from his cousin's 17-year-old daughter, Sabrina Muxlow. Go ahead, caller. Yes, what's the problem? And the girl came out of the, like, got out of the car, and my, co my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car, and when she got out... Okay, where's your, where's your dad's house? Um, it's in North Florida. Where would he be going with this female? He came over to my dad's house, borrowed a shovel, a gas tank, and something else. Okay, we've been looking for this female. You are just so wonderful to call us and give us this, this information. Okay? Yeah. During this call, she confirmed the captor as being Michael King. Michael had shown up unexpectedly at his cousin Harold's home at around 6pm and he parked his car on the grass verge opposite in such a way that the driver's side was facing the house. 
He told Harold that his lawnmower had become stuck in mud in his front yard and asked if he could borrow the three things mentioned in the call, a gas can, a flashlight and a shovel. As he handed Michael the items, Denise managed to free herself and escape his car, where she screamed at Harold to call the cops. Harold asked what was going on and Michael replied, nothing, don't worry about it. He then bundled Denise into the back of the car, climbed over the driver's seat and sped away. At first, Harold thought it was some domestic argument between his cousin and a new girlfriend, but something didn't seem right. For whatever reason, maybe he didn't want to implicate his cousin or himself, he didn't call police. But he did call his daughter Sabrina, who immediately dialed 911, as we heard. It was during the struggle to restrain Denise that she was able to get hold of Michael's phone to make her own 911 call, right after the car pulled away. The items Michael borrowed worried police, and so the race was on to apprehend him. They knew who the captor was, they knew what car he was driving, and they knew he had Denise. Now they just had to find him. Feeling anxious, Harold drove over to Michael's home to see if he was there, and whether or not there really was a lawnmower stuck. There was no sign of Michael, and his car wasn't in the driveway, and there was no lawnmower either. At 6.30pm, just seven minutes after Sabrina Muxlow's call, another 911 call came in. It was a woman named Jane Kowalski who had stopped at this junction, South Cranberry Boulevard, on Highway 41 heading south, when she spotted something suspicious. 911, where's your emergency? Well, I'm on 41 going south, and uh, I'm going to do a cross street right now. It's at, I'm on Chamberlain... I just crossed Chamberlain, I'm on 41 going south, and I was at a stoplight, and a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. What kind of vehicle was he in? It's a blue Camaro, like Camaro, like uh, in the 90s or early 2000s or something. The vehicle had a white male, white male driver, and there was a child screaming in the car. So and banging on the window, oh, like, okay. I've got everybody hollering at me and just one second. He's gonna turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. Do you want me to turn? Try to follow him or? Okay, does he want her to follow him? Okay, can you turn? Oh, just... oh. He just turned on Toledo Blade. I don't know if I can catch up. There's a bunch of traffic and I can't get over. Jane believes she was witnessing a child abduction. The full call hasn't been released, but she was able to give a description of the driver and the car he was driving. An old Camaro, although it was by now dark and she mistook it for blue. She saw the driver using one hand to steer the car whilst pushing someone's head down in the back seat. Someone who was slapping the window of the car and screaming. Jane said the screams were horrific, terrifying, and she'd never heard anything like that in her life. She made eye contact with Michael and knew immediately something awful was occurring. As the lights changed, Jane hesitated in the hope that the Camaro would pull away first and she could get a look at the license plate. But Michael seemed to be onto her. He hesitated too, and both cars remained stopped on the green light for a while. Eventually Jane moved and Michael switched lanes and started driving right behind her. Jane drove slowly in an attempt to frustrate him, hoping he'd overtake so she could follow his car, but he just slowed down too. This is when Jane made her 911 call, where we heard he made a sharp left on Toledo Blade, speeding off towards Interstate 75. Police had the information they needed. They had the location of Michael King's Chevy Camaro and of Denise, but this is where things take a frustrating and tragic turn. The section of Highway 41 that Jane had just driven crossed the boundary from Sarasota County into Charlotte. This was the only call that was picked up by Charlotte. All the others were taken by Sarasota. Jane's 911 call wasn't properly logged and deputies in the area were never dispatched. As you could hear from the call, the office sounded pretty chaotic and the operator was relaying the information to dispatchers, yelling out to two of them. Both acknowledged the information, but neither sent patrol units to the location. The dispatchers put the blame on shift changes and an understaffed environment for the mishandling of Jane's call. Both were later suspended without pay.
Despite the search helicopter and multiple patrol units standing by, the knowledge of Michael's car's exact whereabouts was never passed on to them. What's worse is that it later emerged that a patrol officer was stationed on Toledo Blade at the time of the call. Michael and Denise would have driven right past him. The following day, Jane Kowalski saw Michael's photo on the news and immediately recognised him as the driver she'd seen. She called the police to follow up on the call, identifying herself as the woman who had made it and asked if they needed any more information. To her shock, they had no idea who she was and no knowledge of her call at all. At 6.50pm, 20 minutes after Jane's call, a fifth call came in. This one was from Michael's cousin, Harold Muxlow. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the emergency is exactly, but I think there's somebody that's been taken without the, uh, they don't want to be where they need to be. Uh-huh. And we're in a 95 Green Camaro from Northport somewhere. Okay, and how do you know this? I know. Is he going to hurt the girl? I don't. Did you, you saw them, though? Yes. Yeah. And what, where was she? In the car. In the car? Was she okay? Yeah, she looked like she wanted to do that. Harold made this call from a public payphone, and he was being deliberately vague in his accounts. He didn't seem to want to give his identity for whatever reason. I don't have the rest of the call, but he basically gave the same information that his daughter already had. Two more long hours passed with no more leads until 9.16pm when State Trooper Edward Pope, who was positioned on Toledo Blade, spotted Michael's green Camaro turning from the road onto the on-ramp for I-75 southbound. He sped after the vehicle before performing a felony stop, blocking Michael's car with his own. He immediately drew his weapon and ordered Michael to exit his vehicle. Five times he ordered Michael to get out of his car, but he refused to comply. After the fifth time, Pope advised that if he refused, he'd open fire on him. On hearing this, Michael finally got out and was apprehended. He was wet from the waist down and his shoes were covered in mud. The phone that Denise had used to call 911 was found in his pocket with the battery removed. Pope checked inside the vehicle, but there was no sign of Denise. A muddy shovel was lying on the back seat where she'd been tied up a couple of hours earlier. The Camaro was towed to North Point Police Department for a thorough examination. Inside, they found the SIM card and a gas can in the passenger footwell. Blood was found inside the car and on a blanket in the back seat. Denise's palm print was on the outside of the driver's window. Blood spatter and hair strands were found stuck to the black car bra, along with a strange, viscous sap. But this wasn't all they found. Hair strands torn out from the root were found tucked into the pocket behind the driver's seat, along with Denise's heart-shaped ring, the one she never took off. It seemed to police that she'd left her own evidence to make sure her captor wouldn't escape justice. Finally, they had their man, but Michael King refused to play ball. He wouldn't provide any information as to Denise's whereabouts and maintained his innocence throughout. He gave them the silent treatment during questioning. His cousin Harold even made a visit in an attempt to convince him to tell police and Denise's family her whereabouts, but he didn't. Eventually, he did talk, when he tried to suggest he'd had consensual sex with Denise, and that they were ambushed by men in ski masks before she was killed after being shot by someone in a helicopter. No, seriously. A warrant was obtained for Michael's home, and police conducted a thorough search of the property. There, they found a number of disturbing pieces of evidence. The master bedroom had a yellow blanket taped over the window, and a bed with heavy-duty restraints attached. There was a mirror propped against the wall, facing the bed. On the floor was a Winnie the Pooh blanket that tested positive for blood and semen. The semen matched Michael's DNA profile to the exclusion of 1.1 quadrillion other individuals. Wads of duct tape stuck to hair were found in the bedroom and in the kitchen. The roots of the hair matched Denise's DNA profile to the exclusion of 110 trillion individuals. Saliva was also extracted from the duct tape, which matched with Michael. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to fit together. 
Michael had been cruising along Latour Avenue hunting for a victim, and sometime between 1.30 and 2pm, he brazenly kidnapped Denise from her own home in broad daylight. He drove over to his home where he bound her with the tape and held her captive for three and a half to four hours, forcing himself upon her repeatedly. When he was done, that's when he drove, with Denise still restrained, to his cousin's home to borrow the items, and when the series of 911 calls began. An immediate and extensive search for Denise was started, and on January 18th, the day after she went missing, a canine search team were canvassing an area of land just off Plantation Boulevard, which connects with Toledo Blade, the very same road where Jane had told the operator that the Camaro had turned the previous day. There, they spotted two piles of sand close to a disturbed patch of earth. There was blood visible in both of the patches of sand. According to the crime scene technician, it appeared that the sand had been placed on top of blood and had absorbed it. It wasn't until the following day that a forensics team were able to excavate the land. And there, at a depth of 3 feet 1 inch, the team discovered the nude body of Denise lying in a shallow, waterlogged grave in the fetal position. She had a single gunshot wound to her head, just above her right eye. A 9mm shell casing was found in grass nearby, and the team also located Denise's underwear and shirt a couple of hundred metres away from the gravesite. The underwear contained semen that irrefutably matched with Michael King. An autopsy was performed on Denise's body, and the examiner concluded that she had died from a single gunshot wound to the head, most likely from a 9mm round. The entry wound made it evident that the gun had been placed directly against her right eyebrow before it was fired. The examiner also confirmed that Denise wasn't blindfolded at the time, and that the gun was placed in her field of view, so she would have been aware of what was happening if her eyes were open. The blood spatter and hair found on the car bra indicated that Michael's car had been parked close at the time she was shot, and the strange viscous sap was likely ocular fluid, following what they described as the explosion of her eye when the shot was fired. Aspirated blood was discovered in her lungs, which indicated that, tragically, she had remained alive and breathing for a period of time after she was shot. Denise had fought bravely. She had multiple defensive injuries and bruises, as well as ligature marks on her wrists caused from her being tied up. Two pieces of duct tape were removed from her hair. Michael King's semen was also found inside her. Michael King went on trial facing charges of first-degree murder, sexual battery and kidnapping. He pled not guilty to all charges. Predictably, his defence attorneys attempted to portray him as a hard-working single father, a man who had no previous run-ins with the law and no history of violence, a man who snapped under the mounting pressure of personal and financial hardship. They also weighed heavily on his childhood sledding accident and his resulting frontal lobe damage. PET scans discovered unusual activity and a significant divot in the front of his brain, which his family said had caused a sudden change in his behaviour. When he was 13, he almost killed his brother with a bow and arrow, mimicking a cartoon he'd seen. When he was 17, he watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, after which he started chasing his family around with a chainsaw with a blank expression on his face. After his accident, he required special education services for children with low IQ. He suffered severe headaches and constant buzzing in his ears. One of his friends provided a statement telling the court that in the days preceding the abduction, Michael had become very paranoid, asserting that neighbours were spying on him, looking through his windows. His defence focused on the fact that individuals who suffer frontal lobe damage are far more likely to exhibit poor judgement, take excessive risks, are poor at regulating aggression, and have difficulty separating reality from fantasy. Extensive cognitive tests were taken out, which concluded that Michael did have a very low IQ, but also that he understood the natures of laws, actions and consequences. They also attempted to focus on the actual killing, the gunshot wound, the lack of any weapon or evidence that it was Michael who fired the shot. But a witness for the state, Robert Salvador, testified that on the morning of Denise's abduction, he'd met Michael at a local firing range. This was less than two hours before she was kidnapped. Robert testified that Michael removed a 9mm handgun from beneath the passenger seat of his Camaro, where it was placed again at the end of the session. Investigators swept the floor of the range for casings where Michael had been firing his gun. 
and the tool marks on the casing from the burial site perfectly matched three of the 47 they had collected from the range. Michael's defence was unravelling quickly. The blood and DNA evidence against him was overwhelming. Denise's 911 call was played to the jury, and his cousin Harold testified that it was Michael's voice on the tape. And Denise's own evidence helped to seal his fate, the strands of hair and her beloved heart-shaped ring that were tucked behind the seat. It took the jury just two hours to unanimously find him guilty on all counts, and on December 4th, 2009, Michael King was sentenced to death. He filed an appeal in 2012, but it was rejected, and he remains on death row to this day. Michael's younger brother Jim and his wife Carrie would go on to care for his son, who was at this point 13 years old. He required counselling to deal with his mother's abandonment and his father's actions. Denise's family went on to file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Charlotte County Police following the dispatcher errors. This was settled out of court for $1.25 million. In the months following her death, Nathan Lee set up the Denise Amber Lee Foundation, and I'll put a link to their website in the description. He spent the subsequent years touring the country and performing talks about the importance of standardising proper training for emergency dispatchers. Honestly, the energy he's put into it is admirable. The foundation is still just as active today as it ever was. And with the help of her father Rick, the Denise Amber Lee Act was passed unanimously in 2008. The Act provides towards optional training for 911 operators. Denise's family continue to push for a new law, Denise's Law, that would make it mandatory for 911 operators to undergo proper training and certification. The judge presiding over this case noted how rare and unusual it is to be able to hear some of a victim's last words, but Denise's 911 call and the evidence she planted were crucial. She fought to live, and then to make sure that if she didn't, her captor would face justice. It's impossible to know if things could have gone differently if it weren't for the botched handling of that important 911 call, but ultimately she was failed by a lack of proper dispatch training. It wasn't easy for Denise's father to face the reality that it was the same police department that he'd dedicated 25 years of his life to that was accountable for what its own sheriff described as a missed opportunity. Thanks so much for stopping by and watching this video here with me inside the little shop of crime. I really appreciate you, and hopefully I'll see you again next time. Bye.